how many of you like to paint? Any of you like to? All right. You do too. Isn't it cool? I love painting. I have painted with oils and watercolors and pastels and just on colored pencils or sometimes a combination of it all. I just love it. But you know what? Sad to say, I wouldn't call any of my art a masterpiece. Oh, well, I keep trying. But there are some other people whose work I have done. This is on our brochure. This is uh, Greg Olson. Isn't that cool of him up in the sky? And here he is walking on the road to Emmaus with the deci some disciples. That's beautiful stuff. And then there's this picture right here. See this one? And that's Nathan Green and of Jesus coming. Doesn't that look beautiful? Wouldn't you like to say you had done that? I would. I wonder. Hmm. I wonder if I was to just take a pen here and write my name on it. Do you think anybody would believe that I did this painting? No. Oh, but I want so much to claim it. Well, the name's not staying on anyway, is it? But anyway, maybe God knows I would get too proud if I had a really great masterpiece like that. I don't know. But even though I'm not a master artist, I know one. Do you know a master artist? God is our master artist, isn't he? Yes. All we need to do is look around us everywhere. The sunrise, the sunset, the trees, the beautiful flowers, and all kinds of mountains, so much. And we know our master artist has been at work, hasn't he? Creating just beautiful things. Yes. I have something here I'm going to show you in my hand. I want you to tell me what that is. What is that? What? What? Sand? Okay, what's another name for it? Yes. Dirt. Did you know we were made from dirt? You and I, we were all made from dirt. God took some dirt and formed the first man, and that's how we were created in the first woman. Now, now, I remember when I was little, like you guys, my brother and I would get the dirt wet. We lived in the desert, and we would get this dirt wet, and we'd make mud pies and mud cookies and mud cakes. But would we eat them? No, because they weren't real, right? And we certainly weren't able to take the dirt and make a person out of it. But who did? Yes. So do you think, since I can't even make anything real out of dirt, that I have any right to act like I'm greater than the one who made everything? No. But sometimes we do. Sometimes we think, oh, I'm great at this, and I'm the best at that, and oh, I'm better than anybody in this way. Is that how God wants us to be? No, in Revelation it says, trust, trust in God, give him the glory and the honor and the praise, and worship him. Does that sound like we should be looking at how great we are? No, who does it look like we should be worshiping and giving honor and glory and praise to? God, yes. And actually, Jesus says that we should watch this closely, okay? Watch over here. I need all eyes over here. It says we should take and let him take our the dirt of our lives and let it be emptied out of us. Just dropped down and and taken out of us and let him so fill us 
that who will be lifted up and praised? God will be. Jesus will be. Yes. We don't need to worry about how great we are. We want to be letting other people know how great our God is that made us. And actually, do you know what? The Bible says he's the giver of every good and perfect gift. So if you're good at painting, if you're good at singing, if you're good at... What are you good at? What? Musical instruments, what did you say? Drawing? Yeah, if you're good at any of that, who do we give the honor and praise to? God, yes. I had this hat on before because this was an artist hat, but now I'm going to switch hats for another story I'm telling about a man that had a little bit too much pride. He wanted to be a sea captain, but he wasn't one. But he did have a boat, and he did have a megaphone. Do you know what a megaphone is? Megaphone is a thing you talk into, and it makes your voice really loud. <laughs> okay, sorry if I blasted you out. Anyway, um, he liked to go out in his little boat every day because he dreamed of being a ship captain, okay? And so when he would go out, he would call out to the other boats and ships, Ship Ahoy, what ship is that? Where have you been to, and where are you going? And he made him feel important, really important. Anyway, one day, he was doing this on his megaphone. Ship ahoy, what ship is that? And he wasn't paying very good attention because along was coming a great big huge ship that wouldn't even fit in this building. It was so big. And the ship captain answered back on a big loud speaker and he said, he said, this ship is the big gun of Bengal. A hundred days out at sea and headed home. And we are loaded with spices. What ship is that? To which the man that wanted to be a sea captain, who didn't have a very big boat at all, it would just be a little bit of space here on either side, answer back. Uh, only the Marianne, one day out and bound for nowhere in particular. <laughs> he all of a sudden realized how big and huge that ship was and how little and small he was, right? And we need to remember that God is like the big, huge ship so much bigger and mightier than us. And we're like the little sea captain on his little boat, the wannabe sea captain. And really, when we do, we'll remember how much we need him and how much he can do for us. So we want to trust him for everything and give honor and glory and praise to him and worship him, not ourselves. Who are we supposed to worship? Who are we supposed to give glory to? Yes, let's remember that because the devil tries to tempt us to give it to ourselves, but it's really not for him, is it? I mean, for us, it's him, right? Let's pray. Thank you, dear Jesus, that you are the God of the universe, the biggest and best friend we could ever have, and with you comes everything that we need. We don't have everything we need naturally, but you do. And you want to write your ways on our heart. You want to make us just like you. Thank you, Jesus. We love you and we thank you for being our best and dearest friend. Amen. All right, you can go back to your seats. Thank you. I don't think you can have too many prayers, so I'd like to have one more. All right. Heavenly Father, we are looking together in for the book of Revelation, but we're looking for a particular person. We're looking for Jesus. It starts out, the, the, the revelation of Jesus Christ, and I pray that you give us fresh glimpses of him. I pray that you'd stir our hearts and that the Holy Spirit would give us spiritual eyeglasses, spiritual hearing aids, if that's what we need. 
so that we can glimpse you and love you more and more. That's my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. I have a friend who's a member of a congregation uh, on the eastern side of the United States, and that church is over 110 years old that he belongs to. And uh, it's been there a long time, and they decided that recently that they wanted to do a renovation, remodel, and make it a little bit more contemporary. Now, at that church, there's a stained glass window that's up, up in the area where you would have the cross right there, there's a stained glass window at that church. It's been there for over 100 years, and the stained glass window is a stained glass representation of Jesus having a conversation with the rich young ruler. Those of you who are familiar with the story of the rich young ruler, uh, a, a wealthy young man comes to Jesus in Scripture, and he says, I'd like to be your follower. And you remember Jesus says to him, um, well, uh, leave everything behind and join me. You remember the story. And the rich young ruler decides he can't part with his, you know, his goods, his material possessions. And so he ends up uh, bailing out. And it says in Scripture that it grieved Jesus' heart because he loved him. He loved the young guy. He just like, man, oh, too bad. Anyway, that's their stained glass. They have that stained glass, and Jesus is reaching out towards the rich young ruler who's in the per in the process of sort of turning away. And Jesus is like going, you know, like, come on, we can, we can, we can make this work. Come on. Anyway, they're going to get rid of the stained glass, and they want to replace it with three angels. Now, I have a friend who goes to that church, and he said that it's very disappointing to him because he said it seems to me every week when I look at that picture, it feels to me as though God's talking to me. And he's saying to me, don't let the things of earth eclipse our relationship. And he says, every week, that's just an inspiration for me. See, Jesus, you, I, I picture he's reaching out to me. Not that I'm a rich ruler, but I can easily let the things of earth eclipse Jesus and become more sidetracked with things that are of lesser value. So he says, it's an inspiration to see that. And he says, I, I'm not going to, I'm, I'm going to miss seeing that on a weekly basis. Uh, he says they're going to put three angels, and, and, and they said that they want to put the three angels up there because they're found in the book of Revelation and uh, chapter 14, and, and they want to put the three angels of, of chapter 14 and the book of Revelation up there. He said, it seems to me if you were to ask the angels, would you like to replace Jesus? The angels would say, no way, no way. We are all about pointing to Jesus. He says, so I personally prefer that they keep Jesus up there. And, and he says, I think if you ask the angels, they'd vote for the same thing. Anyway, that's his opinion. Now, the reason I started with that is because I'm actually going to refer to um, three angels' messages that are found in the chapter 14 of the book of Revelation. Those of you who were able to be with us last night as we began this looking for Jesus in the book of Revelation, uh, we looked at chapter 1. And in chapter 1, Jesus starts off by telling us he hasn't forgotten us and he's coming back for us and it's all going to be good. And he wants friends and he's looking your way and he's looking my way. If you're able to be here for the first one we had this morning, which started at 9.30, the message of that one was that Jesus is knocking on our heart's door saying, can we be friends? I'd like to come in. I can bring everything with me that you need. I just would love to have your time and attention because I'd like to be friends with you. This one is entitled, Who Gets the Glory? And uh, it's going to be kind of a, uh, 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 an expanding of the message that we find these three angels giving in chapter 14. Clearly, you cannot go an exhaustive presentation on the book of Revelation in just 12 presentations when there's all these different chapters and there's so much in each one. But we're doing kind of a hop, skip through, and we're looking for Jesus each time as we look. Now, people who have studied chapter 14 of Revelation have sort of summarized the messages that these three angels give uh, as, number one, a warning again of, of, of a coming judgment. Let's see if I get our slides to work here. A warning about judgment. Uh, the second message that they summarize as they look at the three angels' messages is they say there's a plea here to stay out of false churches and then the third message that they seem to derive typically when they look at these three angels' message is what they, I'm going to call an indictment of the beast power. But I said a moment ago, that I'm motivated to look for Jesus in the book of Revelation, and I believe the angels would want us to focus on Jesus. 
And so uh, I want to take another look at that. I want to ask, for example, is the hour of God's judgment has come really the message of the first angel, or is it not? Let's look at the message in Revelation 14, verse 6. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting what? Gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, every tribe, every tongue, and every people. So it was the everlasting what? Gospel. Hmm. To preach to every nation, every kindred, every tongue, and every people. Would that include Muslims? Yes. Would it include Hindus? Yes. Would it include Buddhists? Yes. So what message are we to take to them and to everyone else? Watch out for the judgment? Stay out of false churches? Is that the message that all people around the world need to hear? No, it says that we take the everlasting gospel. The everlasting gospel. Hmm. So what is the everlasting gospel? Let's keep going. Revelation 14 verse 7 says, the very next verse says, Fear God and give glory to Him. Does say for the hour of His judgment has come, and that's probably where it comes up that people have assumed that this message is about judgment. But let's keep looking at it. Fear God and give glory to Him for the hour of His judgment has come and worship Him who made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of water. Now, the hour of God's judgment is a phrase that's included in this message, but I'm going to suggest it is not the message. It is subservient to the message. It's not the message. It's a part, but it's not the message. For starters, we already noticed it's the everlasting gospel. The everlasting gospel. And according to the book of Daniel, prophetic book in the Old Testament, the judgment actually has a starting point. So if something is everlasting, would it have a starting point? If it's everlasting, it wouldn't have a starting point, right? So that eliminates the judgment as the subject matter because it's the everlasting gospel. In order to try and figure out what the everlasting gospel is now, we're going to do something that you probably, um, maybe if you were like me, did not look forward to this when we were taking classes in English literature and had to diagram sentences. Did you ever have to diagram a sentence? That was not my high um, strength, you know, diagramming sentences. But in order to see if we can figure out what the everlasting gospel is and the real message of these angels, we're going to try doing a little bit of diagramming. So it's a compound sentence. It has three parts, and we're going to look at the three parts as we try to break it apart. So um, <clears throat> many years ago, my dad who was a preacher. Decided he wanted to try and figure out what the everlasting gospel was, what was the real message of these three angels um, that had often been focused on. And so he decided to try and diagram. And as he diagrammed it, uh, the first part says, fear God. Now, the verb is fear. And God is the object. But if you are accustomed to diagramming sentence, you understand that the subject is you. That's the subject. It's called, it's called an understood subject. Um, so the concept is you understand that you're the one who's supposed to fear God. The subject is understood. All right. The second part of, the, of this angel's message <clears throat> is give glory to him. Now, um, the verb is give, the object is glory, and once again, the subject is you. It's understood again. You give glory. And then to him, I think, is a prepositional phrase. Drop that down off to the side. Now, the third part of this compound message or sentence is worship him. Once again, the subject is you. And the verb is worship, and the object is him. So now, after these everlasting parts, where does judgment come in? Because we're looking for where does the judgment come into this concept that the three angels' messages are about judgment? Where does it come in? Well, it sounds a little bit like the judgment is sort of like a prepositional phrase. Um, and my father, when he was trying to figure all this out, he, he was talking about these three angels. And he said the hour of God's judgment is a prepositional phrase. He said that. He said it's just part of the message, but it's not the message. It's a prepositional phrase. Well, when he said it in a, in a public meeting, there was a person there who was a book editor at a local publishing house. And the book editor said to my father after the meeting, 
I know you're trying to point out that the everlasting gospel is the real message and that the hour of God's judgment isn't the message of the three angels, <clears throat> but don't call it a prepositional phrase because you re reveal your ignorance when you talk like that. He said, um, it's actually an adverbial clause. So the next time you ever talk about it, uh, make sure you get it right. Well, my dad was grateful to have had from a book editor the truth on that subject. And so the next time, which happened to be, he was speaking at a public university and he was talking, he'd been asked to talk about uh, prophetic literature and he was using this very concept that he had gotten adverbial clause and trying to show what the, th what the everlasting gospel was in the three angels' messages. And he said it was an adverbial clause. He said, the hour of God's judgment has come, he said, is an adverbial clause. And he felt very confident as he said it because a book editor had told him what to say, right? Well, after that presentation, the chairman of the English department came to him and said to him, I don't know whoever gave you the idea that that's an adverbial clause. The chairman said, I understand what you're trying to say, that the everlasting gospel is, is the big deal and that the hour of God's judgment is subservient. I understand that, but you need to get it right. Don't call it an adverbial clause if you want to look like you know what you're talking about. He said, call it a conjunctive clause because that's what it is. It's a conjunctive clause. Well, my dad was a little embarrassed, but he was at least relieved to now know that the chairman of the English department at the university could give him, set him, set him straight. And so truth is, he was asked to speak about this at a seminary back at Andrews uh, University in, in, in Michigan, Berrien Springs, Michigan. And they asked him to come and talk about the three angels' messages of Revelation 14. Well, he knew now he had the ducks in a row because the, the English professor told him so. So as he was talking, he says, many times people think the hour of God's judgment is the key message of the three angels. But he says, I'm here to suggest that it's not. The everlasting gospel is the key message. And the hour of God's judgment, it's a conjunctive clause. It's not the heart and matter. It's a conjunctive clause. Well, he thought he was going to be, you know, going for, but it turns out that the, um, uh, one of the professors at the seminary who was a Greek professor specialized in biblical languages, he came up to my father afterwards and he said, you know, I just want you to look a little bit more clever like when you talk about this in the future. And he says, it's not a conjunctive clause. He said, it's actually a causal clause. Well, my dad probably thought like, oh, of course. <laughs> How could I have missed a causal clause, right? <clears throat> So from now on, what we're going to do, in order to be safe, we're going to call it a causal adverbial conjunctive prepositional phrase clause. That way nobody can set us, um, you know, get on. But the point, what I'm really trying to make about this is that the hour of God's judgment is not the heart of the message. It's subservient. It's not the core. The everlasting gospel is. And what is the main message? The message is you fear God, you give glory to God, you worship him for the hour of his judgment has come. So the idea of fearing, worshiping, giving glory is the main heart of it. I'm going to say that there's a common thread through all of the book of Revelation, and there's a common thread through the three angels of Revelation 14. I'm going to put the common thread on the screen. The common thread in the book of Revelation is that we are being given a warning against depending upon ourselves, self-worship and depending upon ourselves. And we're being given an invitation to a deeper life of faith, a relationship with Jesus, personal, meaningful, tangible. Instead of depending on our works and our behavior and our rules and our regulations, depending on our personal friendship with him, that's the especially as we approach the end of earth's history and a coming judgment. So the judgment isn't the heart of the matter. The relationship with Jesus is. The thread running through the book of Revelation and actually the thread running through the entire Bible. The British Navy, they have um, the riggings for the, for the, you know, when you have a sailboat, you don't call it ropes. You call it rigging. And if you call it ropes, then they laugh at you and they think you don't know you. It's like the conjunctive clause kind of stuff, you know. Um, but but uh, the, the, the rigging in, a, in the British Navy, well, they have braided rope. And, and as a way of identifying their ropes from all the rest, they have a scarlet thread that runs through the length of every one of their ropes. So it identifies the rigging 
of the, of the British Navy because of the scarlet thread that goes through all of the ropes. And the scarlet thread that goes through the Bible, the scarlet thread that goes through all of the three angels' messages that we're focusing on just this moment in this presentation has to do with a personal relationship with Jesus and worshiping him, bringing glory to him, especially as we come close to the time of earth's history that I believe we're in right now. Now, before I go any further, I want to just read you three paragraphs that were actually written to my church. I'm a Seventh-day Adventist Christian, and into my denomination 130 years ago, uh, I want to read you three little quotations that I think are worth thinking about. Here's the first one. There are but few, even of those who claim to believe it, that understand the third angel's message, and yet this is the message for this time. So it sounds like the, the author here is saying that this is an important message, but very few are getting it. So here's another one, another little quotation quick. Not all of our ministers who are giving the third angel's message really understand what constitutes that message. So once again, the idea is there's some confusion about what the three angel's messages are all about. And here's one more. Uh, the third angel's message must be presented as the only hope for the salvation of the perishing world. Uh, the theme of greatest importance is the third angel's message, which embraces the message of the first and second. Now let me ask you a question is watch out for the beast and stay out of false churches the only hope for a perishing world. No, that's not the only hope for a perishing world. Towards the end of the 19th century, in my subculture, my Seventh-day Adventist denomination, there was a group of people who got very excited about Jesus. They got very excited to the point where they said, it's all about Jesus. Somehow we got confused. Somehow we thought that other things were more important. We got so sidetracked on making sure that we nailed down all the doctrinal truths and all of the proof texts that we overlooked him. We overlooked Jesus, and they got very excited about focusing on him and introducing other people to a friendship with Jesus. And it got so exciting that that's pretty much all they could talk about. Well, as they kept talking about the matchless charms of Jesus and how wonderful it is to be friends with Jesus and how he's looking to be friends with each of us, knocking at our heart's door, as we pointed out in the previous presentation this morning, there was a group of what I'm going to call the old guard, kind of conservative, older church members who got a little bit nervous as they saw all this focus on Jesus coming to the top. And they said, wait a minute now, wait a minute. We don't want to forget about our important truths. We don't want to make, forget about the, the, the important facts. We don't want to forget about the doctrines that we've nailed down. And it sounds like these people are taking us off down another tangent and it could be dangerous. In fact, they got so concerned that they began writing letters of concern and to uh, to uh, our we have a, a church periodical and they started writing letters to the editor for our church periodical saying we're alarmed about this message what about the doctrines what about our important truths what, this is leading us astray well so many letters of of concern from the old guard came in to our church periodical that this was penned back, this response was penned back in 1890. This is what was written. Several have written in inquiring if this message of justification by faith or being dependent on Jesus by faith instead of by my works and my good behavior, getting God's approval by relationship instead of by behavior, rules and regulations. They said, several have written inquiring if the message of justification by faith is the third angel's message. And I have answered it is the third angel's message in verity. That word in verity, it's sort of an old word, but it kind of means like this. You better believe it. Like right on. Absolutely. You betcha. Uh-huh. I mean, there's a lot of different ways you can say it, but bottom line was that the third angel's message is really about faith in Jesus. Really? How could they have been concerned back then that Jesus was going to be taking us down the wrong path if we focused on him? Um, were they really off base? Well, let me read you one more little quotation here. Um, there is not one in a hundred who understands for himself the Bible truth on the subject of justification by faith, which is so necessary to our present and eternal welfare. Now, just a moment ago, it said that the message of justification by faith was the third angel's message in verity, right? We just saw that a moment ago. Absolutely, that's what the three angels are all about. But not unless the very next one I just put on the screen says, not one in a hundred understands uh, the subject of justification by faith. So now if not one in a hundred, put two and two together. If not one in a hundred understand the subject of justification by faith, then not one in a hundred understand the three angels' messages. Does that make sense? Because the two are hand in hand. They're, they're the same. 
And so the church that wants to put the three angels up on the front of the stained glass needs to think very carefully about what it is that needs to be front and center, right? Could it be that there's a misunderstanding there? Well, you might say, man, the church was just confused back there 130 years ago. It's a good thing that we've become more progressive and that we're more enlightened now and that we don't have such archaic thinking. But I want to I help you understand something that's a little bit alarming to me, and that's this. Surveys taken in churches, and not just in my denomination. I've been a member of many different locations where I live. I've become a member of the Ministerial Alliance, which is like all the different denominations, pastors getting together, uh, sometimes twice a month, sometimes once a month, and they share with one another and encourage and pray together and so on. And um, I've discovered something that's a bit alarming, and I'm going to share it with you next. It's this. Of the people who attend churches, my denomination as well as all the others, Of the people who attend, not the people who stay away, not the people who don't come, but of the people who do attend, surveys are taken asking this question. Um, Please describe which of the following best describes your personal spiritual life. Um, And then they have options to choose from, and the survey has five to ten questions on it, and it's been given in countless uh, hundreds, thousands of churches and denominations around the world. And here's the alarming statistic. Of the people who attend church and fill out the survey, four out of five, on the average, on the average, present company excluded perhaps, four out of five who attend church describe their personal spiritual life like this. Regular in church attendance, little or no daily time with Jesus. So, I go to church. Yeah. But in terms of actually having quality time alone with Jesus, morning by morning, day by day, for the purpose of growing and knowing Him and His Word and through prayer, very minimal, little or none. Now think about it. What's four out of five? What's that? Is that 80%? 80% of the average church attendees by their own surveyed acknowledgement, have little or no daily time with Jesus, even though they go to church. Now, that word, justification, and that phrase, justification by faith, which is found in Scripture, what that really means is becoming right with God through relationship with Jesus. That's what it means. Big words means that a relationship with Jesus. And it's not talking about a once a week experience. It's talking about an ongoing, regular, daily experience. Therefore, if 80% on the average of church members who are attending have little or no daily time for Jesus, then they're still missing the message that the three angels are trying to help us grasp, which is it's all about him. And that thread, they said, that runs all the way through the message of the revelation, as well as these three angels in the Bible, an invitation to a personal relationship with Jesus, depending on him instead of upon myself. And by the way, if I don't have any time for Jesus during the week, who am I depending on? I'm depending on myself, right? If I'm not coming to him, growing to know him better, learning to love and trust him, then I'm depending on myself. And the message that we just noted is an invitation to quit depending on myself and enter into a meaningful relationship with Jesus, learning to know and trust Him instead of depending on myself. Margie, when she was doing the little presentation here a little while ago, she did something about um, being cast in the dust, and I want to put a quotation on the screen just now. What is justification by faith? Well, it's the work of God in laying the glory of man, depending on myself, my own efforts, my own energy, my own keeping of the rules, whatever. Laying the glory of man in the dust and then doing for man that which it is not in his power to do for himself. Well, let's just ask ourselves a question. How much can I do for myself? Spiritually speaking, how much can I do for myself towards my own salvation or towards overcoming my faults and failures and sins in my life? 
In John 15, verse 5, Jesus said, without me, you can do how much? Nothing. How much can I do for myself, spiritually speaking? Without Jesus, zero, nothing. So I decided I'd try to make that as a, as a mathematical, you know, kind of a representation on the screen for an illustration here. So I, I, you, that's, that Y stands for you on the left side of the screen all by yourself. You by yourself, me by myself, all alone, spiritually speaking, equals zero. Without Jesus, we accomplish nothing. That's the illustration. Now, Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So now notice here, this time on the equation, on the left side, Y, that's you, or me, plus Christ, that would be X. We sometimes say Merry Xmas, Christ, Christmas, X. Okay, so Y, you, plus X, Christ, equals, and that's supposed to be the infinity sign, the little sideways eight. So trying to illustrate that one, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. If I'm in relationship with Jesus, all things are being accomplished. Now, let's just very quickly, um, let's see what the next slide looks like. Yeah. <clears throat> Notice that the two equations on the same blackboard, if you will, or whiteboard or whatever you want to call it, um, in the one equation, me or you, without Jesus, how much is getting done? Nothing. That's the one on the bottom. In the top equation, where you or me are with Jesus, how much is getting done? Everything. So now, if nothing gets done without Jesus, but if everything gets done with Jesus, then who would be responsible for whatever it is that's getting done? Jesus, right? The only difference between the two equations is the presence of Jesus. And then the result is exponential, right? The result is exponential. Therefore, if Jesus is responsible for the all things, if that's his part, what would my part be? Getting with Jesus, right? Um, if you were a hitchhiker and Jesus pulled over, it would be smart to say, yeah, thanks for the ride, I'll get in, you know? And let him take you to the destination, right? So the smart thing is getting with and continuing to get with and stay with Jesus. That's relationship talk. That's friendship with him. That's knocking at your heart's door saying, can I come in? Can we get to know each other? Can we be friends? Can we spend time together? And that's this message of justification by faith. Now, if he's the one who's responsible for the all things, then who would be the one who would get the credit or the glory for it? Huh? Wouldn't it be him? Right? Margie tried to make the point that if she signed, that was a Nathan Green picture I had up there on the screen. The kids were seeing a version that she had up here. A beautiful picture of the second coming of Christ. And Margie, Nathan Green's the artist who put that one together. And Margie said, well, suppose I just took this painting and I just signed my name to it. I um, think people would give me some credit, a little honor, a little glory for that one. It's a great picture, Margie. Love your picture. No, you don't take credit for somebody else's work. At least you shouldn't, right? You don't deserve the credit. You don't deserve the glory. So who gets the glory if Jesus is responsible for the all things? He's the one who gets the glory. Now, let's see how that fits into the message of the three angels. Let's look a little deeper. The first, remember we had it divided into three compound sentences. First one was fear God. What does this word fear God mean? Remember you fear God? We had it out on the, on the, on the diagram. Obviously, it doesn't mean be afraid of God, like shaking in my boots, terrified of him. It means hold him in awe. Hold him in awe. Um, realize who he is and who you are. And when you realize who he is and who you are, it kind of takes your breath away, right? Hold him in awe. Not be afraid of him. Fear the word awe. There's a song in a hymnal called Before Jehovah's Awful Throne. Awe, hold him in awe. Now, I would suggest that if you don't know somebody, you will never hold them in awe. Even if they deserved awe, if you don't know them, let me illustrate what I'm saying. So there's this, um, there's this uh, store called Walmart, right? 
Um, it originated from a, a guy by the name of Sam Walton, living in Arkansas. I think it's called Bentonville. It's where Sam Walton grew up. And that's where the Walmarts launched from. Very first Walmart, Sam Walton, Bentonville. And then it went from there until they're everywhere. Okay, so Sam Walton went looking one day in an old beater pickup. 20-year-old pickup. Scratched and dented, fainted. He was wearing overalls and a John Deere cap. And he went looking for semi-trucks to haul goods from one place to another. So in Bentonville, he went to the dealership for the Freightliner. That's one of the kinds of trucks that are out there. You've seen them, Freightliner. There's Peterbilt, there's Freightliner, there's Kenworth. He went to the Freightliner dealership. And he got out of his beater pickup with his overalls and his John Deere cap, and a salesman approached him, and the salesman said, how can I help you? And Sam Walton said, I'd like to look at semis. And the salesman said, well, sir, I'm going to suggest you maybe find another place to look because we don't show semis to people who can't afford them. He said, each one of those trucks is about a half a million bucks. And you don't just come around here and kick the tires. Um, so you might want to go look for a truck somewhere else. So Sam Walton got back in his truck, his pickup, and he drove down to Peterbilt, and he bought 300 Peterbilt semis. <laughs> how, do you think the, how do you think the Freightliner uh, shop fell when they found out that a guy bought that many semis, right? And the owner of the Freightliner franchise there said to the guy, he came to our franchise and you sent him away? What were you thinking? And the salesman said, well, I didn't know who he was. So what's my point? I'm not saying that we should hold Sam Walton in awe, but if you knew that a billionaire was looking at your trucks, it would just sort of make sense to treat him with respect, right? But if you don't know who it is that's looking at your truck and you determine by judging his outward appearance that he's a nobody, well, then you've just blown it big time, which is what that guy did. He blew it big time. And the reason he did is because he didn't know who it was. Our daughter, Lindsay, was flying across the country and she had to make a connecting flight in Salt Lake City. And um, so she gets off of her one plane and she's got to go to another terminal to get to um, the plane that she's going to connect her connecting flight. And as she's walking down the corridor in the Salt Lake City airport, she, Meg Ryan, she sees Meg Ryan walking right beside her to the left. And she's like, my, my daughter, our daughter, she's like, whoa, Meg Ryan. I'm sure that's Meg Ryan. And, but my, my daughter doesn't want to be like the paparazzi that just kind of, you know, get in the face of the celebrities and, and never give them any breaks. So Lindsay, just, our daughter name is Lindsay, so she's, she's trying to walk. She's trying not to be like Gaga or whatever you want to say it, you know. So she's kind of like going. <laughs> Finally, she just can't bear it. So she kind of sidles up against Meg Ryan. And she says to her, I really enjoyed you in, and then she names a film she'd seen Meg Ryan in. And Meg Ryan smiled at Lindsay and said to her, oh, bless you, sweetheart. And Lindsay's like, oh, Meg Ryan said, bless me, sweetheart. Oh, oh, oh. Anyway, she keeps walking, and she, did, she kind of backs away then, and she keeps walking. Well, it turns out Meg Ryan's going to the same plane that Lindsay's going to get on. So they end up coming to the same waiting area. And you know how in the airports they have rows of chairs that are stuck together, and then they have back-to-back. -back, there's another row of chairs going down, right? So she said Meg went and sat down on a particular chair, and after she sat down, she pulled the collar of her overcoat up. She put a little hat on that had a, lot, uh, had a brow on it. She put sunglasses on, and then she picked up a magazine and started holding it kind of in front of her face. 
Lindsay said she got the unspoken message, the body language, that this lady is wanting to be incognito. She doesn't want to be mobbed, so Lindsay stays away. Well, the entire back row, right behind Meg Ryan, was a bunch of college guys. They were like from a soccer team or something. And at the time, these guys would have thought Meg Ryan was like, you know, and they were sitting right behind her with their backs to her the whole time. And Lindsay's going, boy, wouldn't they know? Wouldn't they, wouldn't they love to know who's sitting behind them? But Lindsay doesn't tell them. And when they call for first class passengers to start boarding early, Meg gets on and goes on. As she's going down the little hallway, jetway, or whatever, to the, tra- to the plane, Lindsay takes the opportunity. She says to the guys that are all lined up behind her, she says, Did you guys see Meg Ryan sitting behind you? <laughs> they're like, What? Yeah, that's her right there going down the. Yeah. Are you kidding? She was sitting. Oh, oh, we didn't know who it was. You get my point. In order to hold somebody in awe, you have to know who they are, right? So when the message of the first angel says, you fear him, nobody's ever going to fear God, that's hold him in awe, if they don't know him. Which means that once again, then the underlying initial message of this first angel is, get to know him, become friends with him. A relationship with Jesus is not only your privilege, it's your opportunity to become friends with God. You know? Well, let's keep going. Um, the second part of the compound sentence says, give glory to him. Once again, you're the subject. Give glory to him. If I haven't yet discovered that I can't save myself, That means I'm depending on me instead of on the, right? What was the percentage I told you of the average church attendees in terms of spending time with Jesus? Four out of five don't. One out of five do. That means that one out of five is depending on him. Four out of five are not depending on him, right? Okay, so then if I'm not depending on him, who's going to get the glory for whatever gets done? Me. Why? Because I did it. And that's why we have these phrases like, you're the man, you know? We can do this. We got this. Those kind of phrases, those are all about us. All about us. And when we're not depending on Jesus, it's very quickly that we turn to me. All about us. If I haven't discovered that I can't save myself, and I'm working on being a Christian by going to church but having no daily time for Jesus, then I am depending on myself and he does not get the glory. You'd be amazed at how easy it is to overlook giving credit to God. I'm going to tell you a story. It's sort of a sad story from my own experience. It's a shameful story, actually. Um, Many years ago, I was working at a high school. It was a parochial, a church high school. It was a church high school that was sponsored by my own denomination, Seventh-day Adventist High School. And I was teaching religion classes there. They called me the Bible teacher at that school. Well, that school, um, <clears throat> I had a break between two classes one day, and I thought, I need to get some banking done. And there's a drive through teller, drive through window at the bank just three miles from the school, and I think I'm going to go try and get that done between class periods. So I uh, go running over to our house because our house was real close to the school. We had two vehicles in the driveway. One of them was the regular car we drove on a regular basis. The other one was a van. It was a three-quarter ton Chevy panel van, pretty good-sized van. And it, was, it had been sitting there for pretty much the whole winter. This was early spring. And I thought, you know, I ought to take the van because it's been sitting for so long that I ought to take it out and just kind of get the cobwebs out of it and get the gas flowing through. And so so I jumped in the van to go to the, do my quick little errand to the bank. Well, I should have figured something was not going to be too good when I tried to start the motor because it went like this. But then it started. And I thought, okay, good, good. It's, it's clear that I need to drive this thing because the generator, the alternator needs to be given some juice to the battery. And this is good that I'm using this car. So... I drive the van down. Now, the place I'm going to get the money exchange or whatever, I'm going to cash the check or whatever I'm going to do, deposit. 
um, in order to get to the teller of the window, you have to enter into a little like driveway. It has cement curbs on both sides, and it curves around the bank and around through a bunch of shrubbery and some grass and some plants and comes up to the window. So once you get into the little driveway, it's just wide enough for the cars, you know. There's not, you know, there's no two lanes there. You know, you get in, you're kind of funneled in. You understand what I'm saying? And so I'm in this line, and it turns out everybody in town seems to have decided they're going to do banking business during the same time I am. And I get into this line, and in short order, I have about eight or nine cars behind me all wrapped in the line, right, as we're working our way through the driveway to get to the window. But I'm, you know, thinking, well, it's taking a little longer than I thought, but oh well. And I've caught cars in front of me, too. But finally, it comes my turn. I come right up to the window, and the lady, she pushes the little button, and the tray comes out, whoop, and over the microphone. She says, how can I help you, sir? And at that very moment, the van ran out of gas. I said to her, I just ran out of gas. She said, you came to the wrong window. She said, what are you going to do? You're obstructing the entire line. I said, um, I don't know. And I got out of the van, and it's a big three-quarter ton van. And I, I put it in neutral, and I tried to push it. and I barely got it to kind of start rolling, and I pushed it forward down this little driveway thing until there was a little wider spot, and I got off into the wide spot, so out of the way. But I have a class coming up, and I need to get back. And I'm thinking, boy, this is not good timing. So I, I see a gas station about a block away, and I take off on a run for the gas station. I get to the gas station, and as I say to the guy, this is back in the day, because I was like probably about 30 years old at the time. So back in that day, you could get a gallon, get this, you could get like a gallon of gas for 39 cents. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and, and so I, I said to the guy, I said, just give me a gallon of gas or a couple gallons if you have in a can. I ran out of gas back in the bank driveway, and, and, and so he's filling me up, right? Give me a dollar's worth of whatever I say to him. He's filling me up. And as he's filling me up, I say, oh, man, this is not a good day for me. I said, I drive in a van that hasn't been driven for almost a year. It's been sitting all winter long, and um, battery's almost dead, and I'm, not wor I'm, I'm worried about that. I'm not going to have enough battery power to pump the gas all the way to the front before it just kind of gives out. And I'm telling him all this while he's filling up the thing. I'm in a hurry. He finishes filling. I give him the money. And as I start to run off, he says, good luck to you. I said, thanks. I'm going to need it. And I take off. I run back. I pour the gas into the, can into the car, into the van. And then I rush around. i got to get back to teach my Bible class, right? So I hurry back. to the. I get into the driver's seat. And then I think to myself, why don't I say a prayer? Have you ever heard people talk about how we tried this, we tried that, we tried everything. There was nothing left to do but pray. Have you ever heard people talk like that? I thought, well, why don't I pray first? So I said this in prayer. I said, Lord, um, <clears throat> you know, I, this is not a salvation issue. If you don't start the car, I'll still love you, and I'll still want to be with you, and so on. So this isn't a salvation issue, but it would sure be nice if you'd start this van for me. And also, it would help me get back to teach Bible class, <laughs> you know? And um, so I say amen. And I turned the ignition key. I'm telling you what, it didn't even turn over. It went boom, started right up, boom. I was so startled. I was like, whoa. I whipped down to take the guy's can back to the gas station where I'd gotten it. I pulled in the driveway there. I give him the can. He comes running up. I said, I'll come back and fill the vehicle up later. Right now, i got to get to an appointment. He says, all right, man. He says, I thought you said it wasn't going to start. And I shouted out at him, oh, I guess I got lucky. And then I headed off to teach Bible class. Who, who just took the credit? Had I had an opportunity to give some credit to God? And do you think it would have been obnoxious if I had simply said to him, I don't know what you think about God, but I said a prayer and the car started, so I'm giving him credit. Would that be obnoxious? No, that's not obnoxious. I didn't have to say to him, I happen to be a Bible teacher and I'd like to give you a study in Scripture on how kind this kind of thing works when we pray and so on and so on. No, that would have been obnoxious. But all I needed to say was, I'm giving God the credit for this one. Instead, I said, I guess I just got lucky. It's far too easy to take the glory that belongs to him 
And, you know, I repent of having done that. And it's a shame that I had to tell that story. I wish it hadn't happened in my life. But it's far too easy for me to forget who gets the credit. It's far too easy for me to, to remember who deserves the glory. And I can tell you this much. When I am spending the most time with Jesus is when I'm least likely to get confused. You know what I mean? Uh, there's a verse here in Scripture, Romans 4.20. Abraham did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but he was strengthened in his face, faith, and he gave what? Glory to God. When you have strong faith, faith is a relationship word, right? Faith is, means the same as trust. Can we agree that trust is a relationship word? So what this is saying is that when you have a strong faith relationship, trust relationship, when that's good, when that's going good, you're inclined to give glory to the right place. Abraham gave glory to God. It's easy to give glory to God when you've been spending time with him. All the glory goes to Jesus. Well, what happens to man's glory? Remember a moment ago I had a, I had a quotation on the screen that said that justification by faith is God's job of laying our glory in the dust and showing us that he can do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. All right? Um, they didn't get that back in Jesus' day. But one woman did. She gave birth to a child and she named him Ichabod. And the words Ichabod meant the glory has departed. In other words, she was saying, God's not at the forefront in our nation any longer. And consequently, the glory has departed. There are people who don't like this message. They, they say, what about self-esteem? What about human worth? What about our pride? And You know, <clears throat> 1 Corinthians verse five, five, chapter 5, verse 6 says, Your glorying is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Some people say, well, can't we have just a little bit? Just a little bit? Just a... No, it's one of those expressions where if you give us an inch, we take a mile. It just works that way. Galatians 6.14 says, God forbid that I should glory except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. So you want to brag about something? You want to take pride in something? You want to glory in something? Glory in the cross. That represents Jesus coming to this planet to rescue people who are full of themselves and give us a chance to get out of here alive. It's wonderful. Glory in that. God forbid that I should glory except in Lord Jesus by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. The final part of the three compound sentences is worship him. Worship him. Once again, the idea is you worship him. Me, we worship him. And I'd like to suggest if God is not being worshipped all week long, just going to church doesn't make worship happen. Think about it. If the only time God gets much of my attention is at church, then even if I sing songs of praise, they're not fooling him. See, if, if someone flatters you, if someone says, someone who really actually thinks you're a snake, but they tell you how awesome you are, that's called flattery. And if we know anything at all about flattery, are we impressed by people flattering us? No. If we know anything at all about where they're coming from, and they say we're so awesome, we know they don't think that way. And we're not impressed by the fact that they said it. Because we, I know what you really think. I heard what you said to so-and-so yesterday about me. So don't go telling me to my face I'm somebody special because I know what you really think. Right? Well, if I sing songs of praise to God at church but he gets virtually none of my attention during the week. Do you know what church is for me? It's flattering God. It's me saying he's awesome. But if he's awesome, how come he doesn't get my focus or attention during the week? And if 80% of the average church attendees have little or no time for Jesus, then what they're doing on the weekend is they're flattering him. And he's not impressed by flattery any more than you are impressed by flattery. So the bottom line then is if I'm really going to worship him, then he's going to get my time and attention all week long, right? He knocks for an entrance every day, not just once a week, every day. And the response that the three angels are wanting us to have is, thank you, Jesus, for wanting to be my friend. Thank you for knocking. Thank you for saying, if I'd open the door, you'd come in and fellowship with me and I with you. I want to make Jesus the center of my life. 
I don't want to have him squeezed into wherever there's a little room left over. I want him to be... I, I'd like to see us change the statistic from four out of five having little time for him during the week to four out of five having lots of time for Jesus. Four out of five. Let's say, how about, let's make it five out of five. How about 100% of us who worship him on the weekend are spending time giving him worship, praise, honor, and glory all week long? That's what I want to do. Jeremiah 9.23 is my final scripture. Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man glory in his might, nor let the rich man glory in his riches. But let him who glories glory in this. This is God talking now through the prophet. Let him glory in this, that he understands and knows me. Listen to a little song that Buddy Hotelian wrote for this about uh, Jeremiah and worshiping God. Can you volume up, please? Thanks. I try to look into their eyes They know wisdom's not the price It's understanding you And I've spent time among the strong Figured out that I was wrong What helps them to carry on Comes from knowing you Knowing you I love is joy and peace Without you love and all would cease You're the only place they have to go Wisdom fades and strength can reign Wealth and greed but you remain Your gorgeous grace The resting place I spend time with wealthy men I've heard it time and time again The greatest riches find them when They're understanding you And may I learn from all this time That if I'm ever meant to shine That my prayer should be that I'm Understanding you No I love and joy and peace Without you God it's all would cease You're the only place I have to go Wisdom fades and strength can win Wealth can flee but you remain Your precious grace My resting place May I learn from all this time That if I'm ever meant to shine That my prayer should be that I understand reminded in the last few minutes that the angels want you to get the tension, want you to get our time and attention. But we confess it's very easy on planet Earth to become distracted by lesser things. I just pray that you'd help us to prioritize and make the things that matter most the things that are actually at the top of our list. May that actually ultimately come down to responding to your invitation to friendship as you knock on our heart's door. May we find more and more opportunities to spend becoming better acquainted with you, not just once a week, but throughout the week. In Jesus' name, amen. Just real quickly, there's going to be a potluck. I think maybe over that way. And um, after the potluck at 2 o'clock, we have the last meeting that we're going to give today in the th series that we're doing. Um, and it's going to be about, if you've ever been to hardware stores that have DIY, that stands for do-it-yourself. We're going to talk about do-it-yourself religion. Is there really such a thing? And that'll be our, our presentation from the book of Revelation at 2 o'clock. But please stay for lunch right over here. God bless you.